Hi, I'm Jennifer Tomlinson, Global Channel Marketing Lead at Microsoft. Welcome to the Partner Marketing Pros Podcast, where we have candid conversations with Microsoft partners all over the world who have achieved strong customer acquisition and retention from their excellence in marketing. In this podcast series, our partners are going to share our marketing experiences, secrets, and best practices, as well as practical advice and resources that can help you improve your marketing results and drive growth. I'm excited to introduce you to your host today, Sharka Shobo, Chief Transformation Officer at Neural Impact. She is a professor of marketing and behavioral science at leading universities in Canada, passionate neuromarketer, and 30-year technology industry veteran who has worked with many Microsoft partners around the world to help transform their customer acquisition to reflect the needs of the new cloud buyer. In this episode, we will explore how to use emotional engagement in your digital marketing to increase buyer interest and conversion. Joining the conversation today is our amazing partner, LS Retail, a leading Microsoft ISV headquartered in Iceland who provides unified commerce solutions for the retail and hospitality industries. And get this, today over 70,000 stores and restaurants across 130 countries use LS Retail's suite of solutions. Joining us to share her many years of marketing expertise is the lovely Eloise Freigang, CMO at LS Retail, who is calling in from Iceland. Welcome, Eloise. Thank you so much for joining us today. So you've led the marketing strategy at LS Retail for 18 years. That's a really long time in this industry. Uh, And your company has such a strong reputation in the Microsoft ecosystem for having some really great marketing. So I... Very much looking forward to exploring together today how you've evolved from a traditional product-based marketing strategy to a much more differentiated emotional one. Thank you so much, Sharka. What a great introduction. Um, And it's really a pleasure to be here. Yes, 18 years and counting seem really like an eternity. (laughs) But, you know, then again, things have changed so much. And sometimes every year or even sometimes daily or hourly seems like, you know, you're having a new experience or a new challenge. So I'm really happy to be here. Great. So my experience is that over the last 20, 30 years, we've seen marketing change so much. And, you know, in the early days in an on-premise type of environment, we very much relied on a sort of solution selling model and focusing on our technological differences and differentiators. We did lots of features and functionality descriptions and talked about the impact it might have for customers from a benefit standpoint a bit, if we were really good at marketing. Um, So tell me about your process and your changes over the years and how emotions have driven some of your purchase decisions and how you're kind of aligning your marketing strategy with that new idea. I certainly, um, you know, up to even four to five years ago, we did very much partner marketing. You know, our website was basically a brochure, like so many of what I see today, you know, still in the industry. And our partners did most of the marketing and the branding. And of course, you know, they would not do the same as what we would do, you know, because they also have their own interest. Right. And also like, you know, and if you've been stating, the world has been changing so rapidly customers they are so prepared and we can just take it from us they are over halfway through the buying cycle before they involve you and before they get in touch with you you know they do your homework it's like you when you want to buy a rolex watch you will first go online you know and you will you will search you will look at pricing you will investigate who's giving you the best deal and this is the same with people buying software it's nothing different and this really impacted how we need to engage with our audience we could not just rely on our partners to do the marketing for us So what we did is we decided to take control of our brand. And that really meant, you know, stop just going to um, trade shows and events and spending a bunch of money, but really getting a strong online presence because everybody is searching online. And this is also a great way in how we can communicate directly with our customers and our prospects. Now, we wanted them to get enough information on our website or any other different sites to make a decision. But at the same time, We also wanted them to reach out to us as soon as possible in the buying cycle so that we can assist them. And, you know, with us moving to the cloud and with SaaS, this is even becoming so much more important. So what we did is we created a new website, and this was certainly a big job, you know, even just deciding on what tools to build the website and also hiring the right staff to do the work, to help us do the work. But, you know, the first step that we take is what we had become less self-centered. 
like you talked about, talking about our functions, our features. And we were very good also talking about how we are a Microsoft Gold partner. Right. And, you know, all these Microsoft awards that we've been given. So, um, let's Eloise, talk we've, that. sorry, we've uh, been auditing a number of partner websites. And one of the things we've consistently seen is that a lot of the messaging in all of the marketing mm -hmm. communications is all about the company, right? We're a Microsoft partner. Exactly. We've been in business a long time. We so We're great. really great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our functions is so great, you know, and we, we normally list all the features and we send out these, you know, newsletters saying, now we've got version so-and-so and look at all these features that we've created. So we needed to focus less on that and rather focus on the customers, on their pain and triggers. What are they searching for? You know, a point of solution to make my job easier or something so we had to invest a lot into content we had to write rewrite everything and we had to re write for personas and we had to make the customer the heroes of our stories right and so i just want to stop you there for a second and, and drill down a little bit on what you just said so the importance of personas uh yes. you know i think a lot of our marketing messaging in the past was very much mass marketing, right? Trying to talk to everybody, but I think that doesn't really resonate with any one buyer. So are you suggesting that defining personas and speaking to specific types of buyers was part of your strategy and the change you made? Yes. Um, you know, we really target a big variety of audiences, but we needed to become more, much more persona based. So, you know, when somebody comes to our website, a lead or a prospect, then, um, we want them to find information that they need. And so let's go a little bit through our online lead journey. When the lead enters our website and converts, you know, what I mean with converting, is they fill in a certain form, for instance, request a demo or download a, download a paper. Then this lead can become a marketing qualified lead. Now we use a system called HubSpot, which is an inbound marketing system. And within that system, we can assign a persona to this person. And the persona is assigned based on their job role. For instance, he's perhaps a CIO. Um, the industry, for instance, this could be a furniture retailer. Their behavior pattern, you know, what resources or pages have they accessed and so on. And so we can drive to let them see based on what they are doing on our website. And then, of course, we also nurture them. Then do you have a different campaign or set of assets that you target specifically to them that speaks to their particular business issues? That is certainly correct. And, you know, and that's why it was so important for us to create great content. So it's like this furniture retailer that I talked about, and he's a CIO. Can we send him information that's pertaining to him, customer reference stories, blogs, articles, white papers, you know, that he or she would find interesting, also depending on what stage of the buying journey this person is at. And we can do that automatically. So we can do that late at night because we've set in automations. So we don't have to be up you know, 12 o'clock in the evening, sending this information to that person. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I remember seeing on your previous website that you also had some tabs and menus on and options for choosing my buying journey based on who I am. Like if I'm a CFO or a CIO. Exactly. So also, I mean, if you're a store, a single store, if you're a store chain, if you're the CEO of the company or the CFO, you know, CFO wants to see different information than a CEO. The CFO, for instance, is very interested in, you know, how they can cut costs, you know, keeping budget and so forth. So we are also, you know, create content based on the, per the person at the company. Right. Now, you mentioned, you know, some of those emotional triggers is what is what I call them. Mm -hmm. Uh what would be some of the key things, for example, if you're, I know you're selling into retail and into some other verticals, can you give us some examples of what some of those emotional conversations and triggers would be in your specific industry? Well, you know, the re retail business is extremely con competitive and fast-paced. Mm -hmm. You know, the retailers are feeling afraid they might be left behind. I mean, just think about Amazon. You know, retailers are so afraid of Amazon. Now, they feel overwhelmed by trying to have the right stock and keeping the cost down. And at the same time, consumer tastes keep changing. And phenomena like fast fashion, think about Sarah, you know, think about H&M, speed up demand. So they are very confused by the sheer variety of technology available. So we will play into those emotions as well and create blogs and articles. And we create, you know, soft selling articles. So we create content that can grab the readers based on their emotions, you know, by their fear. For instance, let's make an example. We will do a blog on stop losing money with double bookings and empty slots. 
Right. And then we will proceed to list the tangible ways our software solutions can help them. For example, in this case, we proceed to describe retailers how they can save time and reduce manual errors by managing the scheduling of events in the same system they use for sales. So they can see how they can get a lot of benefits. And then we can show them how to actually do this. Right. So I, what I'm hearing is the way you phrase your messaging and the conversation mm-hmm. you have with the prospect is around the emotions, things like fear, risk, getting more control, not being in control, you know, losing customers, things yes. that trigger their emotions, that keep them up at night, that drive the buying decision. Exactly. And, you know, fear and greed and also curiosity is the most emotions that we are playing with. Um, not just because it's common. There's always a crisis. And somebody's always going to do better than you. Mm-hmm. But, you know, fear is really the strongest emotion we have found. Yeah. And the one that makes you act. And also desire to be at the top, you know, to be the best one. And to reach or overthrow your competitors is a powerful motivator. Um, but I also have to end, you know, we are in B2B and we are talking to companies. And it's not really just a single store owner, but it's really a big conglomerate that has to take decisions uh, that cannot just take decision on gut. Yeah. So emotions are powerful, but like if you have a board of directors and CEOs, we also have to talk practical benefits. So even though we do the fear and greed, you know, we need to show ROI and KPIs and yeah. we need to show proof. So we need to show other companies that's gone exactly through what they've gone. And if you go to our website, you would find that we've got over 300 references in various different uh, micro verticals within retail and hospitality. So Eloise, in this process of redesigning your website, uh, tell me about the use of imagery. What have you done with that? Have you changed it? How did that play into your strategy? So let me turn it just a little bit around, Sharka, and imagine for a moment that somebody sends you a URL to a website and says, hey, Sharka, check this out. I think this is something you might be interested in. And then you go ahead and click on the link, and you are not having any preconception of what the site is about. In that instant, when you first get a glance on this homepage, in five seconds, you make up your idea. You know, what is this company about? Now imagine, you know, we are going after grocery retailers and we are doing some Google or Bing ads. And this person land back on our website. And when they go to the website and find about grocery retail management solutions, what they see is perhaps, like I've seen many of our, uh, you know, other partners in the ecosystem does, is mm-hmm. they've got maybe just some functions and features with a guy sitting behind a computer. So this is nothing relevant to their industry. It's not eye-catching. I I can't handle any more stock photos of computers (laughs) and laptops and screens, honestly. (laughs) So, you know, if I can make a good example, um, where we've really worked very hard on images, especially on a blog site. So when we do a blog site, we really investigate what is the best image to fit with that article. Because we distribute our blogs through uh, social sites like Facebook and LinkedIn. And when you're like scrolling through LinkedIn and Facebook and you suddenly see this eye-catching picture, you want to click on it and see what it's all about, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we find that also how this has worked very well is that on average, around 40% of our visitors comes to our website through our blog site, you know, and those ones subscribe to our future blogs and our newsletters. And many of them turn out then to become customers eventually. Right. Yeah, you know, I teach neuroscience uh, and neuromarketing Mm -hmm. at a university. And one of the things we've seen in the research is that in terms of imagery, right, being context and environment specific. So in your case, you're talking about, you know, I see a picture of a retail store or I see people at a cash desk. Uh, But more importantly is also faces, right? Our brains and our minds are wired. So important. Mm -hmm. It's so important. I mean, because, you know, when looking at a person's face, you can see what that person is feeling, you know. So if you put a fear message out, you, of course, want to see somebody that's worried like you, staying up at night like you because, you know, your business is not going very well and you resonate with that. Yeah. Great. Now, I know LS Retail has been very focused. I mean, even your company name has the word retail in it, which is a (laughs) strong differentiator. Um, And a lot of partners are still fairly horizontal and they have this fear of loss if they start to focus on a particular vertical or two. Uh, Mm -hmm. Have you found the vertical focus and differentiation key to your strategy? And would you recommend other partners do that? Or what have you seen? I really cannot even imagine that you're not vertical focused. We even think we are too wide still, even though we are focusing on retail and hospitality. 
You know, and the main reasons for our success is, of course, we were born vertical, if I can so say. Mm -hmm. You know, the company was started creating um, a solution for a local retailer. And then um, another retailer that used our solutions called IKEA, they actually had retail and they had restaurants. So they wanted the solution for the restaurants. Oh, okay. And this is how we actually developed the solution for restaurants. I love customer-funded uh, R&D. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know... We are even becoming more vertical because retail and hospitality is really wide, you know, because you have micro verticals under it. Like in retail, you've got verticals like fashion and apparel, furniture, grocery. Under hospitality, you've got cafe bars, quick service restaurants, etc. So mm -hmm. it's also important for us to have my landing pages for these verticals. Because if you're a shoe retailer, you want to go to a page that talks about your pains. You don't want to see something about grocery or general retail. You want something to speak your language. Yeah. And, you know, just by doing that, for instance, we, we created a landing page for pet store retailers. And this has increased so much our traffic. And we've landed a lot of customers because of that. Great. So vertical is a must, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you for, you know, reinforcing that idea. I know it's sometimes a little challenging and difficult for some of the partners to get started. So it's nice to hear from someone who's got a very mature vertical marketing, go-to-market approach. Um, now, in terms of the results, how do you measure it? How do you stay on top of it? You know, marketing's become quite a science today. Yes, it is becoming a big science. But uh, we look very much at, you know, uh, visitors to our website, and we look at marketing qualified leads. And then we measure also how many of them become opportunities and eventually customers. Now, our buying cycle is quite long. And moving to the cloud, we believe this is going to become shorter, mm -hmm. but it's still quite long. So it's sometimes very difficult to, to measure. And this is something we are still learning every day. But we've seen a big, big, big increase year over year because of what we did on our website, because what we did in terms of content. And actually, as we speak now, we are moving to new content management system because we want to increase, you know, these conversions. So it's, it's a constant learning process. It is. I, and I, I call it, you know, I, I sort of define a website as a giant marketing experiment where you do A-B testing and you reiterate or sorry, iterate each time and you redo it and then iterate again and get the feedback and, and modify it based on results. Are there particular tools that you use to do some of your measurement and observation? I know you mentioned HubSpot as yes. part so, of the engine. So I don't want to, you know, like be an advertising for HubSpot, but we decided to, um, five years ago, we built our website on WordPress and with HubSpot as our inbound marketing system. So all the landing pages on that. Yeah. But we had to buy so many plugins for, you know, WordPress and host it on some servers. So actually just two months ago, we decided to move away and actually move um, with some growth design uh, methodology and use HubSpot CMS because they've done incredible changes to their CMS system. Mm -hmm. So we want to really use one system. And so we are currently moving our content to HubSpot CMS. So I can also tell you maybe in six months how that went. Sure. And, you know, where we stand. But this will help us also much more with testing and really focus on personalization for a visitor coming into our website and showcasing even more what he or she needs to see. Right. Have you used heat mapping or any other sort of technology to monitor the behavior on your website? No, but uh, okay. that's a good point. You so know, there's, and I'll up. just mention it now, um, The one of the tools I found, which I found really great, mm -hmm. and I will put a link on the show notes, is called Mouseflow. And it mm -hmm. allow it tracks and records every visit. And you can go and replay it almost like a movie of each person who landed, what they clicked on, where they went and flowed through. So there's lots of new technologies and tools out there today. And some are very inexpensive or on a monthly subscription so that you can mm -hmm. fine tune that. Um, and it'll be interesting to be able to do that on your new site. Now, what were some of the other changes that you're trying to make on this next sort of version of your launch? Um I mean, you already had a really mature, emotionally engaging website. I mean, we are constantly, you know, going over our content. Uh, we have to rewrite basically all our content because we are talking now about unified commerce solutions. We used to talk about omnichannel um, and, of course, moving to the cloud. And we are still trying to map out the whole customer journey within the cloud, you know, with pricing, without the off with the offerings, etc., so mm -hmm. this is something that we probably can revisit also in six months, and I can tell you where we're at. But uh, with with the content, content has been one of the most important things for us, really. 
uh, we have to do a lot of audits and see what we need, what is missing, what we, do we need to rewrite, etc. So we are investing a lot of time and effort there. Okay, great. And uh, a question or just around your digital campaigns. I know a lot of partners are listening and curious to hear different ideas. What would you say is sort of the best campaign you've had and, and was it enga- emotionally engaging and how did that go? Any? Well, you know, we found that LinkedIn works very well for us. Um, I mean, our traffic has gone up over 100% also by starting to use Google Ads. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know... What I can also say, what, what I can give back to the partners as good advice is that we've created a lot of white papers and ebooks, and probably the one that has gotten us the most attention is a ebook on retail trends. And we created this timeless, so we created it two years ago, and it's even downloaded till today. We've got really um, a few hundreds, uh, thousands of downloads of that of that white paper. That's amazing. So, so that kind of underlines amazing. what we were saying earlier about. Um, creating content that's valuable, that educates the buyer during their online search and and researching process um, and having call to actions that actually aren't just to, you know, fill out this form or join our mail list. Instead, it has, it will teach you something, educate you, and it's industry specific. So that's a fantastic example of sort of emotional and industry relevant content. And this and this is, I have to add, this is a little bit also more when they're in the beginning buying cycle. So what we've also done then, you know, as part of the nurturing is that we also have created a lot of more technical white papers, videos, and other resources, mm-hmm. which we can then nurture them with, you know. And, and you know, then they spend a longer time with us, and they come back and back and back again. Yeah. And video, I think, is going to be the new frontier of engagement and content. Exactly. What we've, maybe I can also add, you know, what we've heard also from our sales teams is that, you know, buyers are coming so much more prepared to them once since we've done all of this content and this work on our website. So when they reach out to us, you know, they already know what we are offering. Right. And they're much more engaged. So they're, your salespeople are validating what they've already learned yes. or, or undoing any damage maybe that have, that they've experienced <laughs> or learned along the way, um, rather than starting the whole sales process from scratch, which would hopefully yes, exactly. shorten the sales cycle too and have them yes. further along the decision-making process. Um, yeah. So I have sort of a final question just around, uh, and I know you've been in marketing for 18, or with Alice Retail for 18 years. What about structure and budgeting? Uh, Any advice or comments on partners and how you do that in terms of how much to invest and how to structure your team? I think uh, everybody would agree with me is that we've never got enough money, you know? Yeah. Um, (laughs) So five years ago, we had one and a half person working in marketing and today we're a team of six. Fantastic. And, you know, we always feel like we're overwhelmed. We need more people. Yeah. So we also try to outsource some of the work, you know, to agencies so we can see what can we do ourselves and what can we outsource. It's sometimes very hard with content because then we have to rework it still so much. Yeah. But we try to outsource some of the content work. Um, we used to spend a lot of money on trade shows and events, you know, many years ago. But today we spend much more digitally. Yeah. And we've created like a few events because people want to meet in person still, you know. Yeah. So, so, I, we, so I'm hearing tried, that. Tried to find a balance. Mm-hmm. So I'm hearing that in the industry too is that it, marketing is underfunded. So invest mm-hmm. more. Um, you know, I've worked with partners in every country around the world, and I can tell you most of them have maybe one, one and a half marketing people in general. So I think moving up to two or three and investing, you know, mar- I always say marketing's the new sales, right? In the cloud world, yeah, we have exactly. to automate some of the sales process in the early stages. And, you know, and talking about that, you know, sometimes people advertise for a marketing person and list like 100 things the person must yeah. do. <laughs> I mean, imagine yourself if you have to do everything and have to be a specialist in everything. Yeah. But we need to realize, and every partner who's listening to this, you cannot be a specialist in all the various marketing tasks. Yeah. You know, you need somebody who's a specialist on the web, somebody who's a specialist in social. You know, you need somebody to do content. And mm-hmm. the content person should really love creating content. And you need a graphic designer. You know, yeah. and invest in marketing, it really pays off. I can speak from experience. Yeah. You, you know, you suggested there's some things you need to do strategically internally. And I think that's content messaging, the industry relevance, you know, understanding the value proposition that your solution offers to your industry, but then outsource and have a hybrid model in terms of what you said, like graphics design or SEO or, or you know, some of the analytics, et cetera. Yeah. So keep the strategic things in house and then, you know, hire expertise in specific areas when you need them. Great. Exactly. So um, just before we close, because I think we're out of time today, um, 
If you could recommend one helpful resource or book or website or something to partners listening who would like to learn more, do you have any recommended learning? Well, I I do quite a few. You know, I'm subscribing to Google to get alerts on retail and hospitality, so I get a lot of articles for that. Um, some others, digiday.com, moth.com. And um, again, I have to mention HubSpot is doing a fantastic job. They even have an academy which shows you a lot of resources to do like great blogs or do this and that. Mm-hmm. Um, I also love e-commerce websites because they do a great job at nurturing you through all the cycle. Oh. And then, of course, you know, the smart marketing website from Microsoft, there's a lot of resources on there, especially like for the cloud, there you sure know, how is. to do your listings on App Source and so forth. Don't forget about that site. Yeah, there's amazing content for partners, very specific and targeted. Okay, targeted. great. Eloise, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Partner Marketing Pros podcast. We hope you gain some fresh insights and learn some new practical ideas today that you can implement in your marketing program. See a detailed transcript of the session and helpful links in our show notes. We encourage you now to listen to the companion webinar, which will go into further detail on all of the things that you heard here. It is located within Smart Partner Marketing at aka.ms slash smart marketing. This is just one of a nine-part series that is designed to help you accelerate your marketing efforts to engage buyers and propel your business growth.